The article covers the prehistory and history of Ethiopia from its emergence as an empire under the Aksumites to its current form as the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia as well as the history of other areas in what is now Ethiopia such as the Afar Triangle. The Ethiopian Empire was first founded by Ethiopian people in the Ethiopian highlands. Due to migration and imperial expansion, it grew to include many other primarily Afro-Asiatic-speaking communities, including Amhara, Oromos, Somalis, Tigray, Afars, Sidama, Gurij, Aga, and Harari, among others. One of the early kingdoms to rise to power in the territory was the Kingdom of Mount in the 10th century BC, which established its capital at Yeha. In the 1st century AD the Aksumite kingdom rose to power in the Tigray region with its capital at Aksum and grew into a major power on the Red Sea, subjugating Yemen and Meroe and converting to Christianity in the early 4th century. The Aksumite empire fell into decline with the rise of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula, which slowly shifted trade away from the Christian Aksum. It eventually became isolated, its economy slumped and Aksum's commercial domination of the region ended. The Aksumites gave way to the Zag dynasty, who established a new capital at Lalibela before giving way to the Solomonic dynasty in the 13th century. During the early Solomonic period, Ethiopia went through military reforms and imperial expansion that made it dominate the Horn of Africa. Portuguese missionaries arrived at this time. In 1529, the Adil Sultanate attempted to conquer Abyssinia and met initial success, the Adil were supplied by the Ottomans while Abyssinia received Portuguese reinforcements. By 1543, Abyssinia had recaptured lost territory but the war had weakened both sides. The Oromo people were able to expand into the highlands, conquering both the Adil Sultanate and Abyssinia. The Portuguese presence also increased, while the Ottomans began to push into what is now Eritrea, creating the Habish ILA. The Portuguese brought modern weapons and Baroque architecture to Ethiopia, and in 1622 converted the Emperor Susenyas I to Catholicism, sparking a civil war which ended in his abdication and expulsion of all Catholics from Ethiopia. A new capital was established at Gondar in 1632, and a period of peace and prosperity ensued until the country was split apart by warlords in the 18th century during the Zemini Mesafent. Ethiopia was reunified in 1855 under Theodros II, beginning Ethiopia's modern history and his reign was followed by Johannes IV who was killed in action in 1889. Under Menelik II Ethiopia started its transformation to well-organized technological advancement and the structure that the country has now. Ethiopia also expanded to the south and east, through the conquest of the western Oromo, Sidama, Gurij, Walida and other groups, resulting in the borders of modern Ethiopia. Ethiopia defeated an Egyptian invasion in 1876 and an Italian invasion in 1896 which killed 17,000 Ethiopians, and came to be recognized as a legitimate state by European powers. A more rapid modernization took place under Menelik II and Haile Selassie. Italy launched a second invasion in 1935. From 1935 to 1941, Ethiopia was under Italian occupation as part of Italian East Africa. The Allies managed to drive the Italians out of the country in 1941, and Haile Selassie was returned to the throne from his five years exiled in Britain. Ethiopia and Eritrea united in a federation, but when Haile Selassie ended the federation in 1961 and made Eritrea a province of Ethiopia, the 30-year Eritrean War of Independence broke out. Eritrea regained its independence after a referendum in 1993. Haile Selassie was overthrown in 1974 and the militaristic Derg regime came to power. In 1977 Somalia invaded, trying to annex the Ogaden region, but were pushed back by Ethiopian, Soviet, and Cuban forces. In 1977 and 1978 the government tortured or killed hundreds of thousands of suspected enemies in the Red Terror. Ethiopia experienced famine in 1984 that killed one million people and civil war that resulted in the fall of the Derg in 1991. This resulted in the establishment of the Federal Democratic Republic under Mili Senawi. Ethiopia remains impoverished, but its economy has become one of the world's fastest growing. Prehistory It was not until 1963 that evidence of the presence of ancient hominids was discovered in Ethiopia, many years after similar discoveries had been made in neighboring Kenya and Tanzania. The discovery was made by Gerard Decker, a Dutch hydrologist, 
who found Aculian stone tools that were over a million years old at Kela. Since then many important finds have propelled Ethiopia to the forefront of paleontology. The oldest hominid discovered to date in Ethiopia is the 4.2 million year old Ardipithecus ramidus found by Tim D. White in 1994. The most well-known hominid discovery is Lucy, found in the Awash Valley of Ethiopia's Afar region in 1974 by Donald Johansson, and is one of the most complete and best preserved, adult Australopithecine fossils ever uncovered. Lucy's taxonomic name, Australopithecus afarensis, means southern ape of Afar, and refers to the Ethiopian region where the discovery was made. Lucy is estimated to have lived 3.2 million years ago. There have been many other notable fossil findings in the country. Ingona stone tools were uncovered in 1992 that were 2.52 million years old, these are the oldest such tools ever discovered anywhere in the world. In 2010 fossilized animal bones, that were 3.4 million years old, were found with stone tool inflicted marks on them in the lower Awash Valley by an international team, led by Shannon McFerrin, which is the oldest evidence of stone tool use ever found anywhere in the world. In 2004 fossils found near the Omo River at Kibish by Richard Leakey in 1967 were redated to 195,000 years old, the oldest date in East Africa for modern Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens idol 2, found in the middle Awash in Ethiopia in 1997, lived about 160,000 years ago. Some of the earliest known evidence of early stone-tipped projectile weapons, the stone tips of javelins or throwing spears, were discovered in 2013 at the Ethiopian site of Gadamata, and date to around 279,000 years ago. In 2019, further evidence of Middle Stone Age complex projectile weapons was found at Adama, also in Ethiopia, dated 100,000 to 80,000 years ago, in the form of points considered likely to belong to darts delivered by spear throwers. Bronze Age Contacts with Egypt The earliest records of Ethiopia appear in ancient Egypt, during the Old Kingdom period. Egyptian traders from about 3000 BC refer to land south of Nubia or Cush as Punt and Yam. The ancient Egyptians were in possession of myrrh, which Richard Pankhurst interprets to indicate trade between the two countries was extant from ancient Egypt's beginnings. Pharaonic records indicate this possession of myrrh as early as the First and Second Dynasties, which was also a prized product of the Horn of Africa region. Inscriptions and pictorial reliefs also indicate ivory, panther and other animal skins, myrrh trees and ostrich feathers from the African coastal belt, and in the Fourth Egyptian Dynasty a puntite is mentioned to be in the service of the son of Cheops, the builder of the Great Pyramid. J. H. Breasted posited that this early trade relationship could have been realized through overland trade down the Nile and its tributaries. The Greek historian and geographer Agatharchides had documented seafaring among the early Egyptians, during the prosperous period of the Old Kingdom, between the 30th and 25th centuries b. c. The river routes were kept in order, and Egyptian ships sailed the Red Sea as far as the Mer country. The first known voyage to Punt occurred in the 25th century BC under the reign of Pharaoh Sahar. The most famous expedition to Punt, however, comes during the reign of Queen Hatshepsut probably around 1495 BC, as the expedition was recorded in detailed reliefs on the Temple of Deir el-Bari at Thebes. The inscriptions depict a trading group bringing back myrrh trees, sacks of myrrh, elephant tusks, incense, gold, various fragmented wood, and exotic animals. Detailed information about these two nations is sparse, and there are many theories concerning their locations and the ethnic relationship of their peoples. The Egyptians sometimes called the land of Punt, God's land, due to the large quantities of gold, ivory, and myrrh that could be easily obtained. Evidence of Nakwaden contacts include obsidian from Ethiopia and the Aegean. Antiquity Etymology Ancient Greek historians such as Herodotus and Diodorus Siculus used the word Ethiopia is used to refer to the peoples who live immediately to the south of ancient Egypt, specifically the area now known as the ancient kingdom of Kush, now a part of modern-day Nubia in Egypt and Sudan, as well as all of sub-Saharan Africa in general. The name Ethiopia comes from the ancient Greek word Ethiops. In ancient times the name Ethiopia was primarily used to refer to the modern-day nation of Sudan which is based in the upper Nile Valley and located south of Egypt, also called Kush, and then secondarily in reference to sub-Saharan Africa in general. 
Reference to the kingdom of Aksum designated as Ethiopia dates only as far back as the first half of the 4th century CE following the 4th century CE invasion of Kush in Sudan by the Aksumite Empire. Earlier inscription of Azana Habashid in Geez, South Arabian alphabet, was then translated in Greek as Ethiopia. The state of Sheba which is mentioned in the Old Testament is sometimes believed to have been in Ethiopia, but it is more often placed in Yemen. According to the Ethiopian narrative, best represented in the Kebra Negest, the Queen of Sheba slept with King Solomon and bore a child named Abin Melech. When he was of age, Menelik returned to Israel to see his father, who sent with him the son of Zadok to accompany him with a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. On his return with some of the Israelite priests, however, he found that Zadok's son had stolen the real Ark of the Covenant. Some believe the Ark is still being preserved today at the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Aksum, Ethiopia. The tradition that the biblical Queen of Sheba was a ruler of Ethiopia who visited King Solomon in Jerusalem in ancient Israel is supported by the 1st century AD Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, who identified Solomon's visitor as a queen of Egypt and Ethiopia. DMT. The first kingdom known to have existed in Ethiopia was the Kingdom of Mount, which rose to power around the 10th century BCE. Its capital was at Yeha where a Sabian-style temple was built around 700 BCE. The Mount Kingdom was influenced by the Sabians in Yemen, however it is not known to what extent. While it was once believed that Mount was a Sabian colony, it is now believed that Sabian influence was minor, limited it to a few localities, and disappeared after a few decades or a century, perhaps representing a trading or military colony in some sort of symbiosis or military alliance with the civilization of DMT or some other proto-Aksumite state. Few inscriptions by or about this kingdom survive and very little archaeological work has taken place. As a result, it is not known whether DMT ended as a civilization before Aksum's early stages, evolved into the Aksumite state, or was one of the smaller states united in the Aksumite kingdom possibly around the beginning of the first century. Aksum The first verifiable kingdom of great power to rise in Ethiopia was that of Aksum in the first century CE. It was one of many successor kingdoms to DMT and was able to unite the northern Ethiopian highlands beginning around the 1st century BCE. They established bases on the northern highlands of the Ethiopian plateau and from there expanded southward. The Persian religious figure Mani listed Aksum with Rome, Persia, and China as one of the four great powers of his time. The origins of the Aksumite kingdom are unclear, although experts have offered their speculations about it. Even who should be considered the earliest known king is contested, although Carlo Conti Rossini proposed that Zoscales of Oxum, mentioned in the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, should be identified with one Zahakal mentioned in the Ethiopian king lists. G.W.B. Huntingford argued that Zoscales was only a sub-king whose authority was limited to a dulis, and that Conti Rossini's identification cannot be substantiated. Inscriptions have been found in southern Arabia celebrating victories over one GDRT described as Nagashi of Habashid and of Aksum. Other dated inscriptions are used to determine a floroid for GDRT around the beginning of the 3rd century CE. A bronze scepter or wand has been discovered at Otsbi Dera with an inscription mentioning GDR of Aksum. Coins showing the royal portrait began to be minted under King Indubis toward the end of the 3rd century CE. Christianity introduced Christianity was introduced into the country by Fermentius, who was consecrated first bishop of Ethiopia by St. Athanasius of Alexandria about 330 CE. Frumentius converted to Zana, who left several inscriptions detailing his reign both before and after his conversion. One inscription found at Oxum states that he conquered the nation of the Bogos, and returned thanks to his father, the god Mars, for his victory. Later inscriptions show Azana's growing attachment to Christianity, and Azana's coins bear this out shifting from a design with disc and crescent to a design with a cross. Expeditions by Azana into the kingdom of Kush at Meroe in Sudan may have brought about its demise, though there is evidence that the kingdom was experiencing a period of decline beforehand. As a result of Azana's expansions, Aksum bordered the Roman province of Egypt. The degree of Azana's control over Yemen is uncertain. Though there is little evidence supporting Aksumite control of the region at that time, his title, which includes King of Saba and Salhan, Himyar and Duradan, along with gold Aksumite coins with the inscriptions, King of the Hopsat or Habashite, indicate that Aksum might have retained some legal or actual footing in the area. 
Toward the close of the 5th century CE, a group of monks known as the Nine Saints are believed to have established themselves in the country. Since that time, monasticism has been a power among the people, and not without its influence on the course of events. The Aksumite kingdom is recorded once again as controlling part, if not all, of Yemen in the 6th century CE. Around 523 CE, the Jewish king Dunuwas came to power in Yemen and, announcing that he would kill all the Christians, attacked an Aksumite garrison at Zafar, burning the city's churches. He then attacked the Christian stronghold of Najran, slaughtering the Christians who would not convert. Emperor Justin I of the Eastern Roman Empire requested that his fellow Christian, Caleb, help fight the Yemenite king. Around 525 CE, Caleb invaded and defeated Dunuwas, appointing his Christian follower Sumyufa Ashawa as his viceroy. This dating is tentative, however, as the basis of the year 525 CE for the invasion is based on the death of the ruler of Yemen at the time, who very well could have been Caleb's viceroy. Procopius records that after about five years, Abraha deposed the viceroy and made himself king. Despite several attempted invasions across the Red Sea, Caleb was unable to dislodge Abra, and acquiesced in the change, this was the last time Ethiopian armies left Africa until the 20th century CE when several units participated in the Korean War. Eventually Caleb abdicated in favor of his son Wazib and retired to a monastery, where he ended his days. Abraha later made peace with Caleb's successor and recognized his suzerainty. Despite this reverse, under Azana and Caleb the kingdom was at its height, benefiting from a large trade, which extended as far as India and Ceylon, and were in constant communication with the Byzantine Empire. Details of the Aksumite kingdom, never abundant, become even more scarce after this point. The last king known to mint coins is Armagh, whose coinage refers to the Persian conquest of Jerusalem in 614 CE. An early Muslim tradition is that the Negus Sahama offered asylum to a group of Muslims fleeing persecution during Muhammad's life, but Stuart Munro Hay believes that Aksum had been abandoned as the capital by then, although Kobushchanov states that Ethiopian raiders plagued the Red Sea, preying on Arabian ports at least as late as 702 CE. Some people believe the end of the Aksumite kingdom is as much of a mystery as its beginning. Lacking a detailed history, the kingdom's fall has been attributed to a persistent drought, overgrazing, deforestation, plague, a shift in trade routes that reduced the importance of the Red Sea, or a combination of these factors. Munro Hay cites the Muslim historian Abu Jafar al Khwarazmi slash Khwarazmi as stating that the capital of the kingdom of Habish was Jarma. Unless Jarma is a nickname for Aksum, the capital had moved from Aksum to a new site, yet undiscovered. Middle Ages Zag Dynasty About 1000, a non-Christian princess, Yodit, conspired to murder all the members of the royal family and establish herself as monarch. According to legends, during the execution of the royals, an infant heir of the Aksumite monarch was carted off by some faithful adherents and conveyed to Shewa, where his authority was acknowledged. Concurrently, Yodit reigned for 40 years over the rest of the kingdom and transmitted the crown to her descendants. Though parts of this story were most likely made up by the Solomonic dynasty to legitimize its rule, it is known that a female ruler did conquer the country about this time. At one point during the next century, the last of Yodit's successors were overthrown by an Agal lord named Mara Takla Haimano, who founded the Zag dynasty and married a female descendant of the Aksumite monarchs or previous ruler. Exactly when the new dynasty came to power is unknown, as is the number of kings in the dynasty. The new Zag dynasty established its capital at Roha, where they built a series of monolithic churches. These structures are traditionally ascribed to the king Gebra Meskel Lalibela, with the city being renamed Lalibela in his honor, though in truth some of them were built before and after him. The architecture of the Zag shows a continuation of earlier Aksumite traditions, as can be seen at Lalibela and at Yemrana Cresto's church. The building of rock-hewn churches, which first appeared in the late Aksumite era and continued into the Solomonic dynasty, reached its peak under the Zag. The Zag dynasty controlled a smaller area than the Aksumites or the Solomonic dynasty, with its core in the Lasta region. The Zag seemed to have ruled over a mostly peaceful state with a flourishing urban culture, in contrast to the more warlike Solomonids with their mobile capitals. David Buxton remarked that the Zag achieved a degree of stability and technical advancement seldom equaled in Abyssinian history. The church and state were very closely linked, 
and they may have had a more theocratic society than the Aksumites or Solomonids, with three Zag kings being canonized as saints and one possibly being an ordained priest. Foreign Affairs Unlike the Aksumites, the Zag were very isolated from the other Christian nations, although they did maintain a degree of contact through Jerusalem and Cairo. Like many other nations and denominations, the Ethiopian Church maintained a series of small chapels and even an annex at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Saladin, after retaking the Holy City in 1187, expressly invited the Ethiopian monks to return and even exempted Ethiopian pilgrims from the pilgrim tax. His two edicts provide evidence of Ethiopia's contact with these crusader states during this period. It was during this period that the Ethiopian king Gebra Meskel Lalibela ordered the construction of the legendary rock-hewn churches of Lalibela. Later, as the Crusades were dying out in the early 14th century, the Ethiopian emperor Weta Marad dispatched a 30-man mission to Europe, where they traveled to Rome to meet the Pope and then, since the medieval papacy was in schism, they traveled to Avignon to meet the anti-Pope. During this trip, the Ethiopian mission also traveled to France, Spain and Portugal in the hopes of building an alliance against the Muslim states then threatening Ethiopia's existence. Plans were even drawn up of a two-pronged invasion of Egypt with the French king, but nothing ever came of the talks, although this brought Ethiopia back to Europe's attention, leading to expansion of European influence when the Portuguese explorers reached the Indian Ocean. Early Solomonic Period Around 1270, a new dynasty was established in the Abyssinian highlands under Yekuno Amlak, with aid from neighboring Mixumi dynasty to post the last of the Zag kings and married one of his daughters. According to legends, the new dynasty were male line descendants of Aksumite monarchs, now recognized as the continuing Solomonic dynasty. This legend was created to legitimize the Solomonic dynasty and was written down in the 14th century in the Kebra Negist, an account of the origins of the Solomonic dynasty. Under the Solomonic dynasty, the chief provinces became Tigray, what is now Amhara and Shewa. The seat of government, or rather of overlordship, had usually been in Amhara or Shewa, the ruler of which, calling himself Mgusa Negest, exacted tribute, when he could, from the other provinces. The title of Mgusa Negest was to a considerable extent based on their alleged direct descent from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, but it is needless to say that in many, if not in most, cases their success was due more to the force of their arms than to the purity of their lineage. Under the early Solomonic dynasty Ethiopia engaged in military reforms and imperial expansion which left it dominating the Horn of Africa, especially under the rule of Amda Seona there was also great artistic and literary advancement at this time, but also a decline in urbanization as the Solomonic emperors didn't have any fixed capital, but rather moved around the empire in mobile camps. Under the early Solomonic dynasty monasticism grew strongly. The abbot Abba Uestate was created a new order called the Uestatians who called for reforms in the church, including observance of the Sabbath, but was persecuted for his views and eventually forced into exile, eventually dying in Armenia. His zealous followers, also persecuted, formed isolated communities in Tigray. The movement grew strong enough that the emperor Dawit I, after first trying to crush the movement, legalized their observance of the Sabbath and proselytization of their faith. Finally under Zara Yaqob a compromise was made between the new Egyptian bishops and the Uistadians at the Council of Mitmak in 1450, restoring unity to the Ethiopian Church. Relations with Europe and Prester John An interesting side effect of Ethiopian Christianity was the way it intersected with the belief that had long prevailed in Europe of the existence of a Christian kingdom in the Far East, whose monarch was known as Prester John. Originally thought to have been in the Orient, eventually the search for Prester John's mythical kingdom focused on Africa and particularly, the Christian Empire in Ethiopia. This was first noticed when Zara Yaqob sent delegates to the Council of Florence in order to establish ties with the papacy and Western Christianity. They were confused when they arrived and council prelates insisted on calling their monarch Prester John, trying to explain that nowhere in Zara Yaqob's list of regnal names did that title occur. However, the delegates' admonitions did little to stop Europeans from referring to the monarch as their mythical Christian king, Prester John. Towards the close of the 15th century the Portuguese missions into Ethiopia began. Among others engaged in this search was Pero de Covilha, who arrived in Ethiopia in 1490, and, believing that he had at length reached the far-famed kingdom, presented to the Ngusa Negest of the country a letter from his master the King of Portugal, addressed to Prester John. 
Kovilha would establish positive relations between the two states and go on to remain there for many years. In 1509, Empress Dowager Eleni, the underage emperor's regent, sent an Armenian named Matthew to the king of Portugal to request his aid against the Muslims. In 1520, the Portuguese fleet, with Matthew on board, entered the Red Sea in compliance with this request, and an embassy from the fleet visited the emperor, Lebna Dengel, and remained in Ethiopia for about six years. One of this embassy was Father Francisco Alvarez, who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the country. The Abyssinian Adal War Between 1528 and 1540, the Adal Sultanate attempted, under Ahmad ibn Ibrahim al-Ghazi, to conquer the Ethiopian Empire. Entering, from the low country to the southeast, and overran much of the Ethiopian plateau, forcing the emperor to take refuge in the mountain fastnesses. In this remote location, the ruler again turned to the Portuguese. João Bermudes, a subordinate member of the mission of 1520, who had remained in the country after the departure of the embassy, was sent to Lisbon. Bermudes claimed to be the ordained successor to the Abuna, but his credentials are disputed. In response to Bermude's message, a Portuguese fleet under the command of Estevão da Gama, was sent from India and arrived at Massawa in February 1541. Here he received an ambassador from the emperor beseeching him to send help against the Muslims, and in the July following a force of 400 musketeers, under the command of Cristóvão da Gama, younger brother of the admiral, marched into the interior, and being joined by native troops were at first successful against the enemy, but they were subsequently defeated at the Battle of Wufla, and their commander captured and executed. The 120 surviving Portuguese soldiers fled with Queen Mother Seble Wangal and regrouped with Ethiopian forces led by the emperor to enact several defeats on the Adal over late 1542 and early 1543. On February 21, 1543, Al Ghazi was shot and killed in the Battle of Wainadaga and his forces were totally routed. After this, quarrels arose between the emperor and Bermudes who had returned to Ethiopia with Gama and now urged the emperor to publicly profess his obedience to Rome. This the emperor refused to do, and at length Bermudes was obliged to make his way out of the country. Oromo Movements The Oromo migrations were a series of expansions in the 16th and 17th centuries by the Oromo people from southern areas of Ethiopia to more northern regions. The migrations had a severe impact on the Solomonic dynasty of Abyssinia, as well as being the death blow to the recently defeated Adal Sultanate. The migrations concluded in around 1710, when the Oromo conquered the kingdom of Anuria in the Jibe region. In the 17th century, Ethiopian Emperor Susenyas I relied on Oromo support to gain power, and married an Oromo woman. While initial relations between the Oromo and Amhara were cordial, conflict erupted after the emperor tried to convert the Oromo to Christianity. Many Oromo entered in Emperor Susanya's domain in response. In the 17th and 18th centuries, much of the Oromo people gradually underwent conversion to Islam, especially around Harar, Arsi, and Baal. The Oromo Muslims regarded the Imam of Harar as their spiritual guide, while retaining some of their original culture and socio-political organization. Scholars believe the Oromo converted to Islam as a means of preserving their identity and a bulwark against assimilation into Ethiopia. By late 17th century, the Oromo had friendly relations with the Amharas. So when Emperor Yasu I tried to attack the Oromo, he was convinced by local Amharic rulers to back down. The Oromo also formed political coalitions with previously subdued people of Ethiopia, including the Sidama people and the locals of Inaria. Jibe and Kingdom of Damat. Gondarin Period. Gondar as a third permanent capital of the Christian kingdom was founded by Fasilatas in 1636. It was the most important center of commerce for the kingdom, early Gondar period. The Jesuits who had accompanied or followed the Gama expedition into Ethiopia, and fixed their headquarters at Fermona, were oppressed and neglected, but not actually expelled. In the beginning of the 17th century Father Pedro Pius arrived at Fermona, a man of great tact and judgment, who soon rose into high favor at court, and won over the emperor to his faith. He directed the erection of churches, palaces and bridges in different parts of the country, and carried out many useful works. His successor Afonso Mendez was less tactful, and excited the feelings of the people against him and his fellow Europeans. 
Upon the death of Emperor Susenyas and accession of his son Fazilides in 1633, the Jesuits were expelled and the native religion restored to official status. Fasilides made Gondar his capital and built a castle there which would grow into the castle complex known as the Fazil Gebi, or Royal Enclosure. Fasilides also constructed several churches in Gondar, many bridges across the country, and expanded the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Aksum. During this time of religious strife Ethiopian philosophy flourished, and it was during this period that the philosophers Zara Yaakob and Valda Haywat lived. Zara Yaakob is known for his treatise on religion, morality, and reason, known as Hatata. Asa Sultanate The Sultanate of Asa succeeded the earlier Imamate of Asa. The latter polity had come into existence in 1577, when Muhammad Jassa moved his capital from Harar to Asa with the split of the Adil Sultanate into Asa and the Harari city-state. At some point after 1672, Asa declined and temporarily came to an end in conjunction with Imam Umar Din bin Adam's recorded ascension to the throne. The Sultanate was subsequently re-established by Qaddafu around the year 1734, and was thereafter ruled by his Mutaito dynasty. The primary symbol of the Sultan was a silver baton, which was considered to have magical properties. Zemini Masafint This era was, on one hand, a religious conflict between settling Muslims and traditional Christians, between nationalities they represented, and, on the other hand, between feudal lords on power over the central government. Some historians date the murder of Iyasu I, and the resultant decline in the prestige of the dynasty, as the beginning of the Ethiopian Zemini Masafint, a time of disorder when the power of the monarchy was eclipsed by the power of local warlords. Nobles came to abuse their positions by making emperors, and encroached upon the succession of the dynasty, by candidates among the nobility itself, for example on the death of Emperor Twuflos, the chief nobles of Ethiopia feared that the cycle of vengeance that had characterized the reigns of Twuflos and Tekel Haimanoa would continue if a member of the Solomonic dynasty were picked for the throne, so they selected one of their own, Yostos to be Negus and Negest, however his tenure was brief. Iyasu too ascended the throne as a child. His mother, Empress Mentawab played a major role in Iyasu's reign, as well as her grandson Eos too. Mentawab had herself crowned as co-ruler, becoming the first woman to be crowned in this manner in Ethiopian history. Empress Mentawab was crowned co-ruler upon the succession of her son in 1730, and held unprecedented power over government during his reign. Her attempt to continue in this role following the death of her son 1755 led her into conflict with Vubit, his widow, who believed that it was her turn to preside at the court of her own son Eoas. The conflict between these two queens led to Mentawab summoning her Quaran relatives and their forces to Gondar to support her. Vubit responded by summoning her own Oromo relatives and their considerable forces from Yechu. The treasury of the empire being allegedly penniless on the death of Iyasu, it suffered further from ethnic conflict between nationalities that had been part of the empire for hundreds of years, the Aga, Amharans, Shoans, and Tigrians, and the Oromo newcomers. Mentawab's attempt to strengthen ties between the monarchy and the Oromo by arranging the marriage of her son to the daughter of an Oromo chieftain backfired in the long run. Iyasu too gave precedence to his mother and allowed her every prerogative as a crowned co-ruler, while his wife Vubit suffered in obscurity. Vubit waited for the accession of her own son to make a bid for the power wielded for so long by Mentawab and her relatives from Quara. When Eowaz assumed the throne upon his father's sudden death, the aristocrats of Gondar were stunned to find that he more readily spoke in the Oromo language rather than in Amharic, and tended to favor his mother's Yechu relatives over the Korans of his grandmother's family. Eowaz further increased the favor given to the Oromo when adult. On the death of the Raz of Amhara, he attempted to promote his uncle Lubo governor of that province, but the outcry led his advisor Valdalul to convince him to change his mind. It is believed that the power struggle between the Korans led by the Empress Mentawab, and the Yechu Oromos led by the Emperor's mother Vubit was about to erupt into an armed conflict. Raz Mikhail Sol was summoned to mediate between the two camps. He arrived and shrewdly maneuvered to sideline the two queens and their supporters making a bid for power for himself. Mikhail settled soon as the leader of Amharic to Green Camp of the Struggle. The reign of Eyas reign becomes a narrative of the struggle between the powerful Raz Mikhail Sol and the Oromo relatives of Eoas. As Eoas increasingly favored Oromo leaders like Fazil, his relations with Mikhail Sol deteriorated. Eventually Mikhail Sol deposed the emperor Eoas. 
One week later, Mikhail Sol had him killed, although the details of his death are contradictory, the result was clear, for the first time an emperor had lost his throne in a means other than his own natural death, death in battle, or voluntary abdication. Mikhail Sol had compromised the power of the emperor, and from this point forward it lay ever more openly in the hands of the great nobles and military commanders. This point of time has been regarded as one start of the era of the princes. An aged and infirm imperial uncle prince was enthroned as Emperor Johannes II. Raz Mikhail soon had him murdered, and underage Tekel Haimano II was elevated to the throne. This bitter religious conflict contributed to hostility toward foreign Christians and Europeans, which persisted into the 20th century and was a factor in Ethiopia's isolation until the mid-19th century, when the first British mission, sent in 1805 to conclude an alliance with Ethiopia and obtain a port on the Red Sea in case France conquered Egypt. The success of this mission opened Ethiopia to many more travelers, missionaries and merchants of all countries, and the stream of Europeans continued until well into Teodros's reign. This isolation was pierced by very few European travelers. One was the French physician C. J. Ponce, who went there in 1698, via Senar and the Blue Nile. After him James Bruce entered the country in 1769, with the object of discovering the sources of the Nile, which he was convinced lay in Ethiopia. Accordingly, leaving Massawa in September 1769, he traveled via Aksum to Gondar, where he was well received by Emperor Tekel Haimano II. He accompanied the king on a warlike expedition round Lake Tana, moving south round the eastern shore, crossing the Blue Nile close to its point of issue from the lake and returning via the western shore. Bruce subsequently returned to Egypt at the end of 1772 by way of the Upper Atbara, through the Kingdom of Senar, the Nile, and the Korosko Desert. During the 18th century the most prominent rulers were the Emperor Dawit III of Gondar, Amaiasis of Shewa, who consolidated his kingdom and founded Ankober, and Tekel Georgis of Amhara, the last mentioned is famous as having been elevated to the throne altogether six times and also deposed six times. The first years of the 19th century were disturbed by fierce campaigns between Raz Gugsa of Begemder, and Raz Valda Selassie of Tigray, who fought over control of the figurehead Emperor Egwale Sayon. Valda Selassie was eventually the victor, and practically ruled the whole country till his death in 1816 at the age of 80. Dejaz Maxebagadeh of Agame succeeded Valda Selassie in 1817, through force of arms, to become warlord of Tigra. Modern 1855-1936. Under the emperors Theodros II, Johannes IV, and Menelik II, the empire began to emerge from its isolation. Under Emperor Theodros II, the age of the princes was brought to an end. Theodros II and Tekel Georgis II. Emperor Theodros II was born Lij Kasa in Kwara, in 1818. His father was a small local chief, and his relative de Jazmak Kinfu was governor of the provinces of Dembia, Kwara and Shelga between Lake Tana and the northwestern frontier. Kasa lost his inheritance upon the death of Kinfu while he was still a young boy. After receiving a traditional education in a local monastery, he went off to lead a band of bandits that roved the country in a Robin Hood-like existence. His exploits became widely known, and his band of followers grew steadily until he led a formidable army. He came to the notice of the ruling regent, Raz Ali, and his mother Empress Manan Liban Amade. In order to bind him to them, the Empress arranged for Kasa to marry Ali's daughter. He turned his attention to conquering the remaining chief divisions of the country, Gojam, Tigray, and Shewa, which still remained unsubdued. His relations with his father-in-law and grandmother-in-law deteriorated however, and he soon took up arms against them and their vassals, and was successful. On February 11, 1855, Kasa deposed the last of the Gondoran puppet emperors, and was crowned Negus and Negest of Ethiopia under the name of Teodros II. He soon after advanced against Shewa with a large army. Chief of the notables opposing him was its king Haile Melikot, a descendant of Maridazmak Osfawosan. Dissensions broke out among the Shones, and after a desperate and futile attack on Teodros at Dabra Burhan, Haile Melikot died of illness nominating with his last breath his 11-year-old son as successor under the name Negus Sal Mariam. Darj, Haile Melikot's brother, and Otto Bezabe, a Shawan noble, took charge of the young prince, but after a hard fight with Angida, the Shones were obliged to capitulate. 
Sal Mariam was handed over to the Emperor Tuoteros and taken to Gondar. He was trained there in Teodros's service, and then placed in comfortable detention at the fortress of Magdala. Tuoteros afterwards devoted himself to modernizing and centralizing the legal and administrative structure of his kingdom, against the resistance of his governors. Sal Mariam of Shewa was married to Teodros II's daughter Alatash. In 1865, Sal Mariam escaped from Magdala, abandoning his wife, and arrived in Shewa, and was there acclaimed as Negus. Teodros forged an alliance between Britain and Ethiopia, but as explained in the next section, he committed suicide after a military defeat by the British. On the death of Teodros, many Shones, including Raz Darge, were released, and the young Negus of Shewa began to feel himself strong enough, after a few preliminary minor campaigns, to undertake offensive operations against the northern princes. However, these projects were of little avail, for Raskasai of Tigray had by this time risen to supreme power in the north. Proclaiming himself Negus and Negest under the name of Johannes IV, he forced Salmarium to acknowledge his overlordship. In early 1868, the British force seeking Teodros' surrender, after he refused to release imprisoned British subjects, arrived on the coast of Misawa. The British and Dajazmat Kasa came to an agreement in which Kasa would let the British pass through Tigray in exchange for money and weapons. Surely enough, when the British completed their mission and were leaving the country, they rewarded Kasa for his cooperation with artillery, muskets, rifles, and munitions, all in all worth approximately £500,000. This formidable gift came in handy when in July 1871 the current emperor, Emperor Tekel Georgis II, attacked Kasa at his capital in Adwa, for Kasa had refused to be named a Raz or pay tribute. Although Kasa's army was outnumbered 12,000 to the emperor's 60,000, Kasa's army was equipped with more modern weapons and better trained. At battle's end, 40% of the emperor's men had been captured. The emperor was imprisoned and would die a year later. Six months later on January 21, 1872, Kasa became the new emperor under the name Johannes IV. Johannes IV. Ethiopia was never colonized by a European power, but was occupied by Italians in 1936. However, several colonial powers had interests and designs on Ethiopia in the context of the 19th century scramble for Africa. When Victoria, Queen of the United Kingdom, in 1867 failed to answer a letter Teodros II of Ethiopia had sent her, he took it as an insult and imprisoned several British residents, including the consul. An army of 12,000 was sent from Bombay to Ethiopia to rescue the captured nationals, under the command of Sir Robert Napier. The Ethiopians were defeated, and the British stormed the fortress of Magdala on April 13, 1868. When the emperor heard that the gate had fallen, he fired a pistol into his mouth and killed himself. Sir Robert Napier was raised to the peerage, and given the title of Lord Napier of Magdala. The Italians now came on the scene. Asib a port near the southern entrance of the Red Sea, had been bought from the local sultan in March 1870 by an Italian company, which, after acquiring more land in 1879 and 1880, was bought out by the Italian government in 1882. In this year Count Pietro Antonelli was dispatched to Shewa in order to improve the prospects of the colony by treaties with Sal Mariam of Shewa and the Sultan of Asa. In 1887 Menelik king of Shewa invaded the emirate of Harar after his victory at the Battle of Chelenko. In April 1888 the Italian forces, numbering over 20,000 men, came in contact with the Ethiopian army, but negotiations took the place of fighting, with the result that both forces retired, the Italians only leaving some 5,000 troops in Eritrea, later to become an Italian colony. Meanwhile, Emperor Johannes IV had been engaged with the dervishes, who had in the meantime become masters of the Egyptian Sudan, and in 1887 a great battle ensued at Galabat, in which the dervishes, under Zeki Tumul, were beaten. But a stray bullet struck the king, and the Ethiopians decided to retire. The king died during the night, and his body fell into the hands of the enemy. When the news of Johannes's death reached Salmarium of Shewa, he proclaimed himself Emperor Menelik II of Ethiopia, and received the submission of Begemder, Gojam, the Yechu Oromo, and Tigray. Menelik II. On May 2 of that same year, Emperor Menelik signed the Treaty of Wakhale with the Italians, granting them a portion of northern Ethiopia, 
the area that would later be Eritrea and part of the province of Tigray in return for the promise of 30,000 rifles, ammunition, and cannons. The Italians notified the European powers that this treaty gave them a protectorate over all of Ethiopia. Menelik protested, showing that the Amharic version of the treaty said no such thing, but his protests were ignored. On March 1, 1896, Ethiopia's conflict with the Italians, the First Italo-Ethiopian War, was resolved by the complete defeat of the Italian armed forces at the Battle of Adoa. A provisional treaty of peace was concluded at Addis Ababa on October 26, 1896, which acknowledged the independence of Ethiopia. Menelik granted the first railway concession, from the coast at Djibouti to the interior, to a French company in 1894. The railway was completed to Deir Dawa, 45 kilometers from Harar, by the last day of 1902. Under the reign of Menelik, beginning in the 1880s, Ethiopia set off from the central province of Shoa, to incorporate the lands and people of the south, east and west into an empire. The people incorporated were the western Oromo, Sidama, Gurij, Walida and other groups. He began expanding his kingdom to the south and east, expanding into areas that had never been under his rule, resulting in the borders of Ethiopia of today. He did this with the help of Ras Gabin and Shawan Oromo militia. During the conquest of the Oromo, the Ethiopian army carried mass atrocities against the Oromo population including mass mutilation, mass killings and large-scale slavery. Some estimates for the number of people killed as a result of the conquest go into the millions. Large-scale atrocities were also committed against the Dita people and the people of the Kapiko Kingdom. Slavery was of ancient origins in Ethiopia and continued into the early 20th century. It was widely practiced in the new territories, and tolerated by the authorities who often owned slaves themselves. Slaves could be bought and sold, and had limited legal rights. They did have the right to worship, and the right not to have their families broken up by sales. Iyasu v. Zauditu and Haile Selassie When Menelik II died, his grandson, Lij Iyashu, succeeded to the throne but soon lost support because of his Muslim ties. He was deposed in 1916 by the Christian nobility, and Menelik's daughter, Zauditu, was made empress. Her cousin, Ras Tafari Makonan, was made regent and successor to the throne. Upon the death of Empress Saudi II in 1930, Rastafari Makonan, adopting the throne name Haile Selassie, was crowned Emperor Haile Selassie I of Ethiopia. His full title was His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, King of Kings of Ethiopia and Elect of God. Following the death of Abba Jifar II of Jima, Emperor Haile Selassie seized the opportunity to annex Jima. In 1932, the Kingdom of Jima was formally absorbed into Ethiopia. During the reorganization of the provinces in 1942, Jima vanished into Kaffa province. The abolition of slavery became a high priority for the Haile Selassie regime. International pressures forced action, and it was required for membership in the League of Nations. Final success was achieved by 1942. Educational Modernization Modernization became a priority for the Haile Selassie regime, it began with expanded education opportunities beyond the small old-fashioned schools run by the Ethiopian church. Menelik had founded the first modern school at Addis Ababa in 1908, and sent several students to Europe. Haile Selassie sent hundreds of young men and women to study abroad, set up the capital's second modern school in 1925. He established schools in a number of cities, as well as training institutions and technical schools. Missionaries were also active in education. By 1925 French Franciscan sisters were well established, running an orphanage, a dispensary, a leper colony and 10 schools with 350 girl students. They settled in the cities of Addis Ababa and Dair Dawa, along the Franco-Ethiopian Railway which opened in 1917. The schools were highly attractive to upper-class Ethiopians. In 1935, 119 Catholic and Protestant missions were educating 6,717 pupils across the nation. Italian Occupation Emperor Haile Selassie's reign was interrupted in 1935 when Italian forces invaded and occupied Ethiopia. The Italian army, under the direction of dictator Benito Mussolini, invaded Ethiopian territory on October 2, 1935. They occupied the capital Addis Ababa on May 5. 
Emperor Haile Selassie pleaded to the League of Nations for aid in resisting the Italians. Nevertheless, the country was formally annexed on May 9, 1936, and the emperor went into exile. Many Ethiopians died in the invasion. The Negus claimed that more than 275,000 Ethiopian fighters were killed compared to only 1,537 Italians, while the Italian authorities estimated that 16,000 Ethiopians and 2,700 Italians died in battle. Some 78,500 patriots died during the occupation, 17,800 civilians were killed by aerial bombardment and 35,000 people died in concentration camps. War crimes were committed by both sides in this conflict. Italian troops used mustard gas and aerial bombardments against combatants and civilians in an attempt to discourage the Ethiopian people from supporting the resistance. Deliberate Italian attacks against ambulances and hospitals of the Red Cross were reported. By all estimates, hundreds of thousands of Ethiopian civilians died as a result of the Italian invasion, including during the reprisal Yekati 12 massacre in Addis Ababa in which as many as 30,000 civilians were killed. Crimes by Ethiopian troops included the use of dum-dum bullets, the killing of civilian workmen and the mutilation of captured Eritrean Ascari and Italians, beginning in the first weeks of war. Italy in 1936 requested the League of Nations to recognize the annexation of Ethiopia. All member nations, with the exception of the Soviet Union, voted to support it. The King of Italy was crowned Emperor of Ethiopia and the Italians created an Italian empire in Africa with Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Italian Somalia, with its capital Addis Abeba. In 1937 Mussolini boasted that, with his conquest of Ethiopia, finally Adwa was avenged and that he had abolished slavery in Ethiopia, a practice that existed in the country for centuries. The Italians made investments in Ethiopian infrastructure development during their occupation. They created the so-called Imperial Road between Addis Ababa and Massaw. More than 900 kilometers of railways were reconstructed, dams and hydroelectric plants were built, and many public and private companies were established. The Italian government abolished slavery, a practice that existed in the country for centuries. Much of these improvements were part of a plan to bring half a million Italians to colonize the Ethiopian plateaus. In October 1939 the Italian colonists in Ethiopia numbered 35,441, of whom 30,232 male and 5,209 female, most of them living in urban areas. Only 3,200 Italian farmers moved to colonize farm areas, where they were under sporadic attack by pro Haile Selassie guerrillas until the end of 1938. The occupation government closed all schools operated by the Ethiopian church, or by missionaries. They were replaced with two new systems. There was a prestige operation for Italians, and rudimentary one for native Ethiopians. Textbooks featured the glory and power of Mussolini and promoted military careers. The natives were given a rudimentary primary education focused on producing submissive and obedient servants of the empire. New school buildings were constructed for the Italian colonists. The plan for development of Italian Addis Abeba in 1939 proposed the creation of the first university in Ethiopia, but World War II blocked it. World War II In spring 1941 the Italians were defeated by British and Allied forces. On May 5, 1941, Emperor Haile Selassie re-entered Addis Ababa and returned to the throne. The Italians, after their final stand at Gondar in November 1941, conducted a guerrilla war in Ethiopia that lasted until summer 1943. After the defeat of Italy, Ethiopia annexed the former Italian colony of Eritrea. Post-World War II period After World War II, Emperor Haile Selassie made numerous efforts to promote the modernization of his nation. The country's first important school of higher education, University College of Addis Ababa, was founded in 1950. The Constitution of 1931 was replaced with the 1955 Constitution which expanded the powers of the Parliament. While improving diplomatic ties with the United States, Haile Selassie also sought to improve the nation's relationship with other African nations. To do this, in 1963, he helped to found the Organization of African Unity. In 1961 the Thirty-Year Eritrean Struggle for Independence began, following the Ethiopian Emperor Haile Selassie I's dissolution of the Federation and shutting down the Eritrean Parliament. 
The emperor declared Eritrea the 14th province of Ethiopia in 1962. The Negus suffered criticism due to the expenses involved in fighting the nationalist forces. By the early 1970s Emperor Haile Selassie's advanced age was becoming apparent. As Paul B. Hensa explains, most Ethiopians thought in terms of personalities, not ideology, and out of long habit still looked to Haile Selassie as the initiator of change, the source of status and privilege, and the arbiter of demands for resources and attention among competing groups. The nature of the succession, and of the desirability of the imperial monarchy in general, were in dispute amongst the Ethiopian people. Perceptions of this war as imperialist were among the primary causes of the growing Ethiopian communist movement. In the early 1970s, the Ethiopian communists received the support of the Soviet Union under the leadership of Leonid Brezhnev. This help led to the 1974 coup of Mengistu. The government's failure to effect significant economic and political reforms over the previous 14 years created a climate of unrest. Combined with rising inflation, corruption, a famine that affected several provinces but was concealed from the outside world, and the growing discontent of urban interest groups, the country was ripe for revolution. The unrest that began in January 1974 became an outburst of general discontent. The Ethiopian military began to both organize and incite a full-fledged revolution. Communist Period After a period of civil unrest that began in February 1974, a provisional administrative council of soldiers, known as the Derg, seized power from the aging Emperor Haile Selassie I on September 12, 1974, and installed a government that was socialist in name and military in style. The Derg summarily executed 59 members of the former government, including two former prime ministers and crown councillors, court officials, ministers, and generals. Emperor Haile Selassie died on August 22, 1975. He was allegedly strangled in the basement of his palace or smothered with a wet pillow. Lieutenant Colonel Mengistu Haile Mariam assumed power as head of state and Dirk chairman, after having his two predecessors killed, as well as tens of thousands of other suspected opponents. The new government undertook socialist reforms, including nationalization of landlords' property and the church's property. Before the coup, Ethiopian peasants' way of life was thoroughly influenced by the church teachings, 280 days a year are religious feasts or days of rest. Mengistu's years in office were marked by a totalitarian-style government and the country's massive militarization, financed by the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, and assisted by Cuba. In December 1976, an Ethiopian delegation in Moscow signed a military assistance agreement with the Soviet Union. The following April 1977, Ethiopia abrogated its military assistance agreement with the United States and expelled the American military missions. The new regime in Ethiopia met with armed resistance from the large landowners, the royalists and the nobility. The resistance was largely centered in the province of Eritrea. The Derg decided in November 1974 to pursue war in Eritrea rather than seek a negotiated settlement. By mid-1976, the resistance had gained control of most of the towns on the countryside of Eritrea. In July 1977, sensing the disarray in Ethiopia, Somalia attacked across the Ogaden in pursuit of its irredentist claims to the ethnic Somali areas of Ethiopia. They were assisted in this invasion by the armed Western Somali Liberation Front. Ethiopian forces were driven back far inside their own frontiers but with the assistance of a massive Soviet airlift of arms and 17,000 Cuban combat forces, they stemmed the attack. The last major Somali regular units left the Ogaden on March 15, 1978. Twenty years later, the Somali region of Ethiopia remained underdeveloped and insecure. From 1977 through early 1978, thousands of suspected enemies of the Derg were tortured and or killed in a purge called the K. Shabir. Communism was officially adopted during the late 1970s and early 1980s. In 1984, the Workers' Party of Ethiopia was established, and on February 1, 1987, a new Soviet-style civilian constitution was submitted to a popular referendum. It was officially endorsed by 81% of voters, and in accordance with this new constitution, the country was renamed the People's Democratic Republic of Ethiopia on September 10, 1987, and Mengistu became president. The regime's collapse was hastened by droughts and a famine, which affected around 8 million people and left 1 million dead, as well as by insurrections, 
particularly in the northern regions of Tigray and Eritrea. The regime also conducted a brutal campaign of resettlement and villagization in Ethiopia in the 1980s. In 1989, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front merged with other ethnically based opposition movements to form the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. In May 1991, the Pert forces advanced on Addis Ababa. Mengistu fled the country to asylum in Zimbabwe, where he still resides. Hundreds of thousands were killed due to the Red Terror, forced deportations, or from using hunger as a weapon. In 2006, after a long trial, Mengistu was found guilty of genocide. The Derg government relocated numerous Amharas into southern Ethiopia where they served in government administration, courts, and even in school, where Oromo texts were eliminated and replaced by Amharic. The government perceived the various southern minority languages as hindrances to Ethiopian national identity expansion. Modern Period In July 1991, the APRIF, the Oromo Liberation Front, and others established the transitional government of Ethiopia, which was composed of an 87-member council of representatives and guided by a national charter that functioned as a transitional constitution. In June 1992, the OLF withdrew from the government. In March 1993, members of the Southern Ethiopia People's Democratic Coalition also left the government. Eritrea separated from Ethiopia following the fall of the Derg in 1991, after a long independentist war. In 1994, a new constitution was written that formed a bicameral legislature and a judicial system. A general election in 1995 to elect the parliament also elected Mili Zenawi as prime minister and Nagaso Gidada as president. Ethiopia's second multi-party election was held in 2000 and Miles was re-elected as prime minister. In October 2001, Lieutenant Girma Wolade Georgis was elected president. In the 2005 general election, allegations of irregularities that brought victory to the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front resulted in widespread protests in which the government is accused of massacring civilians. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, and with the rise of radical Islamism, Ethiopia again turned to the Western powers for alliance and assistance. After the September 11 attacks in 2001, the Ethiopian army began to train with U.S. forces based out of the Combined Joint Task Force, Horn of Africa established in Djibouti, in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. Ethiopia allowed the U.S. to station military advisors at Camp Herso. In 2006, an Islamic organization seen by many as having ties with al-Qaeda, the Islamic Courts Union, spread rapidly in Somalia. Ethiopia sent logistical support to the transitional federal government opposing the Islamists. Finally, on December 20, 2006, active fighting broke out between the ICU and Ethiopian army. As the Islamist forces were of no match against the Ethiopian regular army, they decided to retreat and merge among the civilians, and most of the ICU-held Somalia was quickly taken. Human Rights Watch accused Ethiopia of various abuses including indiscriminate killing of civilians during the Battle of Mogadishu. Ethiopian forces pulled out of Somalia in January 2009, leaving a small African Union force and smaller Somali transitional government force to maintain the peace. Reports immediately emerged of religious fundamentalist forces occupying one of two former Ethiopian bases in Mogadishu shortly after withdrawal. Mili Senawi died on August 20, 2012 and was succeeded as Prime Minister by Haile Mariam Dessalines. On October 7, 2013, Mulatu Tashome was elected President of the country. On April 2, 2018, Abiy Ahmed was declared Prime Minister. Sal Worksud is the fourth and current President of Ethiopia, the first woman to hold the office. Ethnic violence rose with the political unrest. There were Oromo Somali clashes between the Oromo, who make up the largest ethnic group in the country, and the ethnic Somalis, leading to up to 400,000 to be displaced in 2017. Gageo Oromo clashes between the Oromo and the Gageo people in the south of the country led to Ethiopia having the largest number of people to flee their homes in the world in 2018, with 1.4 million newly displaced people. In September 2018 in the minorities protest that took place in Oromo near the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa, 23 people were killed. Some have blamed Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed for giving space to groups formerly banned by previous Tigrayan-led governments, such as the Oromo Liberation Front, Jinbat 7, ONLF and Sidamo Liberation Front. 
In September 2018, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed Ali and Eritrean President Isaiah Safwerki signed a historic peace agreement, ending 16 years of hostility between the two countries. As the result of the agreement, Abiy Ahmed received the Nobel Peace Prize 2019. Fano is an Amharan youth group in Ethiopia, perceived as either a protest group or an armed militia. Fano units are accused of participating in ethnic massacres, including that of 58 Kemen people in Mitema during 10 January 11, 2019, and of armed actions in Humera in November 2020 during the Tigray conflict. Relations between the federal government and the Tigray regional government deteriorated after the election, and on November 4, 2020, Abiy began a military offensive in the Tigray region in response to attacks on army units stationed there, causing thousands of refugees to flee to neighboring Sudan. According to local media, up to 500 civilians may have been killed in a massacre in the town of Mykadra on November 9, 2020. Due to conflicts between TPLF's militia and Ethiopian security forces in alliance with Amhara Regional Special Forces, 25,000 refugees fled from Tigray to Sudan.